Okay, thanks for coming. So today we are having Amadeus uh, for his first talk here. And we'll talk about two minutes. The positions of two minutes. Yes, please. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for the invitation. So yeah, I'm going to talk about limits and forbidden subdivisions. So this is joint work with Edouard Bonnet, Unjun Kim, and Stefan Thomasé and Rémi Vatrigan. So uh, yeah, two is a uh, graph parameter re introduced by uh, my co-authors uh, two years ago. And in this talk, we look at the structure uh, implied by graphs of uh, high twin -wits. So let's first start by a few um, definitions in order to, to introduce twin widths. So for that, we'll need the notion of a trigraph. So a graph is a re your regular vertex set with uh, some uh, edges or non-edges between the vertices. And for a trigraph, you add a, an error edge, let's say, so a red edge. Uh, you, you say that some edges can be red instead of black. So you have three possible relations. Either two vertices are adjacent, or they are adjacent by a red edge, or they are not adjacent at all. So we define a contraction in a, in a trigraph as follows. Uh, so the idea is to take two vertices. So the idea of two know it is to, take two, is to identify vertices that are uh, uh, close from being twins. So we want to somehow record uh, the neighborhood error. and. So we define the contraction of two vertices u and v as oops sorry as um, so as follows it will delete u v and create a new vertex uh, my, my laser doesn't work so it will create a new vertex that is adjacent so that creates red edges towards all private neighbors of v and towards all private neighbors of u and basically keeps the color of the, the, the common neighborhood intact. So in particular, edges that are black for both U and V that aren't errors uh, in, the, in the common neighborhood stay black, and the other ones stay red. So yeah, we have created these error edges on the private neighbors and kept the, the common neighborhood intact. So this is enough to define two units. So um, we we need the definition of a contraction sequence. So sorry, for the co common neighborhood, you just take sorry. the intersection uh, of the right Yeah, sorry. Uh, so for the common neighborhood, I might already have some. So like here, my co common, na common neighborhood is x1 to x7. And I might already have some red edges to uh, from u or v to one of the, the neighbors. And if one of the two edges is red, or like or two of them are red, the new edge from the contraction will also be red. Basically, the only situation where I keep a black edge from the contracted vertex to a neighbor is that both U and V have a black edge towards that neighbor. So yeah, if there was a twin error uh, along the way at any point, I, I will have seen it with a red edge. So is there any reason why you didn't take, say, intersections instead of union? When Building with common edges. Um, you mean so like a red red becomes red, but one of them is black. I would take it black. And that's another possibility. But okay, so the idea is to record. So the idea is to like forget about U and V individually at some point after you contract them, but still keep uh, information about like what they are um, adjacent to. So I I, I want to say uh, I mean I. Uh, if I got the question correctly, yeah, I, I want to keep all my adjacencies al along the contract. So that's just my question is Sorry. regarding about the red edge. Yeah. You take a particular choice for the common neighbor, which is more like a conservative with respect to red. Yeah. So it's ah, okay, okay. permissive with respect okay, to red, but you can take the opposite directions. But I'm just curious why. So if you, you say if I if I said the so for the X four, I can say it's black, the cut off the contraction because okay. well, only one of them is. Right. Okay, okay. So why um, you just want to get some intuition about why you Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. So, um, so if we got some red edge here at, at any point uh, before, it means that uh, somehow uh, V, like the, like, possibly V is also a contracted vertex, right? 
uh, and so, so so v the 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 vertices in v do not see x four so the vertices in in x four um, in the same way so like the, this is not a module I mean, say this is not a module with respect to this so basically there is already a neighborhood error here between v and x four so like it isn't a simple relation between V and X4. And so when you contract V to UV, it, it gets even worse. Like uh, your, your new vertex still has a complex, I mean, still has a, it still has the vertices of V in it that were in V in it. And it will not have a, it will still have a complex neighborhood. Okay. Uh, but I got maybe a bit uh, too, uh, trying to explain that. But so yeah, uh, from so having defined the contraction between two vertices in a trigraph, uh, we define a contraction sequence for any graph G as uh, basically a sequence of repeated contractions between two vertices, um, uh, such that you end in a in a final uh, in, in just one vertex at the end. So here we can start by contracting E and F, and we see that so. E here is not adjacent to A, for, for example, and F is not adjacent to D. So we'll have in the contraction at least those two red edges. That mean, okay, my neighbor, my vertices in E F uh, do not have the same relation to to A and D. Uh, then we can contract uh, uh, A to D and still uh, create some red edges, and we can keep. Uh, contracting as we wish. So basically, this is one of the options for a contraction sequence until we end uh, in a single vertex. And we say that uh, the twin width of a graph G is the least maximal degree uh, at any point during a contraction sequence. So for all possible contraction sequence that we, we could have done here, uh, the one that minimizes the red degree uh, over the, the whole sequence, the maximal red degree over the whole sequence, uh, witnesses uh, the twin width of the graph. So here, if you recall, uh, our contraction sequence kept maximal red degree 2. Oh, okay, At any point? Just, uh, three. What is this? Where? Sorry, no, never mind. <laughs> 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 it just like three yeah. You have three red edges, but red degree. Oh, red degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I want to bound the maximal red degree at any point during the se sequence. So uh, here it's bounded by two, and it witnesses the, the graph has two it at most two. And yeah, you can even see that whatever is the first contraction you're doing, uh, you will create two red edges. So the, the twin of this graph is exactly two. So yeah. Um, so what is this uh, useful for? Uh, so the main result of the of, of the paper of two it one is that uh, given a graph G and a so with with twin D and a D contraction sequence, um, and any first order formula phi, you can decide whether G models phi in uh, FPT time. Uh, so as FPT in uh, the size of the formula and uh, the parameter. So in particular, uh, like any problem expressible in first order model log logic is. Uh, is FPT, so it is efficient somehow with respect to, to twin nets. Uh, so this includes k independent set and k dominating set with uh, those formulas. Uh, but yeah, like a large class basically of problems have uh, FP like FPT algorithms on uh, on classes of bounded twin nets. So, but what graphs do this apply to? It is is twin what 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 classes does it capture? Is it fast enough? So actually, bounded true width, bounded rank width graphs, uh, bounded Q and stack number uh, graphs have all uh, bounded twin width. So if you take any class that is already bounded with respect to one of those parameter parameters, it's also bounded with respect to twin width. And uh, some things that aren't necessarily bounded for the other parameters. Uh, so classes that are proper minor closed, uh, map graphs, and posets of bounded width also have bounded twin width. So this in this talk here, we, we consider not only classes defined by other parameters or um, by such properties, but we look at what structures uh, does a high twin-width graph have to have in it uh, in terms of 
infrastructure. And we show the following, that if uh, graph of girth 5, so of the size of the minimal uh, cycle is at least 5, um, forbids uh, some induced subdivisions of a theta, so the following graph, uh, then it has bounded to it. Um, so yeah. So I'm, I'm going to give a bit of context uh, uh, to like, introduce the relation between graph parameters and uh, forbidden structures. Or like uh, can you go back a little bit? So maybe so theta is this graph. Right? Yes. So uh, I, I will go into more detail ah. later. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, just to state the result, uh, what I will show in this talk is uh, the problem. That graphs forbidden in this kind of shape uh, as an induced subgraph have found it to me. So, yeah, to, to, to give a bit of context on the relation between uh, parameters and graph my and, gra and uh, like forbidden structures, uh, like perhaps the, the most uh, um, like known approach to, to this question, to does my graph if my graph has a high parameter, does it have a like some certain sub structure appearing in it? Is sorry. Is by uh, is by asking whether if your graph has pi high parameter, it has a, a, a graph minor. Um, so, like the the equivalent question is yeah if you if your graph forbids h as a minor, does it necessarily have a, a, a small parameter like a function of h uh, parameter? So yeah, a minor is a a, a graph obtained from uh, from g. Some h obtained by, by from g by uh, deleting vertices, uh, deleting edges, and contracting edges, and uh, we have the following for twinnet that uh, h minor free graphs. So you take any h, you forbid graphs from being uh, having h as a minor. Then the class that forbids h has bounded twinnet. So it's already forbidding too much for twinnet. I mean. The, the situation is known from, known from uh, for two units. So let's look at other um, graph parameters. And so yeah, I, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, two it and minors uh, behave uh, well together. So like you first remark that uh, k times k walls, so these graphs, have a uh, two width uh, at least k. And Robertson and Simo have shown that actually, if if a graph so if your graph class forbids uh, one uh, wall as a as a as a minor, then it has bounded tree width. So somehow uh, classes of bounded tree width are exactly the classes that forbid uh, a wall as a as a minor. Now, the question is, can we be less restrictive? So can we forbid a bit less than a minor? And can we forbid some induced subgraph? For, uh, for instance, uh, we can even forbid induced subdivisions of some graph, because these contain, I mean, these are like forbidding more than the, the graph. So uh, the, the idea is that uh, you also need sparseness, because uh, it's like graphs uh, like KT uh, break any induced subgraph that you could ask for. So uh, yeah, you look at in the talk we will look at sparse classes. Uh, so for some of these definition of sparseness that forbid some uh, induced subdivision of, of some graph. So the question for three widths. So we know that uh, forbidding a wall as a minor bounds the three width. The question is, uh, if you are a sparse class, so let's say high girth or KT3, and you forbid uh, a subdivision of, uh, of some subgraph of the wall, do you get a bounded twin width? Um, to, so yeah, for, for example, one of the subdivisions of, the, of, of a subgraph of the wall is K23 which is the theta, which is uh, the, the graph we are considering uh, in this talk, uh, which, is, which consists of, uh, so it's a subdivision of k to 3, or uh, three uh, disjoint, internally disjoint paths between the same vertices. Um, 
and of length at least two each. So here we can see theta, my laser doesn't work, but <laughs> we can see theta as a, between the two big vertices, uh, there are three uh, induced paths in green uh, that link the, the three vertices, and you don't have any edge between them. So yeah, the question is, if you forbid some small part of the wall as, a for, uh, as a, an induced subdivision, uh, does it bound the, tr the, the tree width? And the answer was given, given by uh, saint Thierry and Trottignon uh, three years ago, uh, which is no. And so you have uh, theta-free graphs of uh, arbitrarily large girths, so as sparse as you want, and arbitrarily large tree widths. And they look like this. They, they call this construction layered wheels. Uh, and yeah, and somehow with this construction, you kind of feel like so it's a recursive con construction. I've only drawn uh, three three layers here, but basically you keep going on and recursively. Uh, yeah, it, it's a quite an intricate example, but these are graphs that have arbitrary large tree width, uh, but avoid a, a theta. But somehow this construction hints at the fact that the tree width cannot be too large. Like somehow, somehow when, when we go from one layer to to the other, like uh, it really looks almost uh, exponential. And uh, indeed, uh, Abrishami, Chudnovsky, Hajevi, and Spirkel have shown that uh, graphs forbidding a theta and forbidding a triangle have um, logarithmic twin uh, true width. So in, in, the, in the size of the, the vertex set. So yeah, we know what happens for theta and true width. But uh, now let's look at maybe other parameters. So what's known in the literature for now is that uh, for degeneracy, things work well. Um, so like if you take a sparse graph, so here we say KTT3, and you forbid an induced subdivision of any H, then uh, your graph is FTH degenerate. So this means that uh, you can find yeah, you, I, I won't go into too much detail, but you can find you can find a, a sequence of vertex deletions from your graph, uh, such that the, the vertex delet deleted at any point uh, is uh, of degree at most uh, f of t and h. Uh, but this doesn't give you too much information, you know, like f model checking, for example. Uh, so we can ask the question uh, about twin width. So. Oh, can you go back? Yeah, sorry. So this is about induced subdivision. Uh, uh, yeah. Is this a new theorem? No, no, no. Ah, uh, sorry. Oof. Uh, I, I forgot to cite my bad. So this is a theorem by Kuhn and Ostus from uh, 2004. So it's quite old. Um, but yeah. Sorry, I forgot to. Uh -huh. Put the citation. So, yeah. um, so now the question is, like for for twin width, uh, what can we hope to forbid uh, as an induced subdivision and get uh, bounded uh, bounded twin width? Um, so, like the first remark is that uh, small subdivisions of the clique have unbounded twin width. So somehow you will have to witness the structure you are forbid uh, in a in a subdivision of K, which well, you can you can witness anything in it. Um, and also, uh, subcubic graphs have unbounded units. So if you forbid anything that is not subcubic, you allow the class of all subcubic graphs, and you have uh, unbounded units, right? So you must for forbid something that is subcubic. And uh, yeah, the, the first, uh, the, the, the optimistic conjecture would be that you, you forbid any subcubic graph and you ask for a, a sparse class. And uh, does it imply bounded to me? So somehow like, the, the, the most uh, you can hope for to try to generalize the, the conjecture, to, to try to generalize the, the approach for three weeks. Uh, so in this talk, we'll forbid uh, Thetas, and we will ask for graphs to be sparse in the sense that they have girth at least five. Um, so yeah, uh, theta again is a subdivision of KQ3. So have you three internally disjoint paths of length at least two. So 
yeah, we'll look at how to bound uh, this uh, class, the twin of classes for building data. Uh, so for this, we need um, uh, like one of the main theorems of the, the first article on, on, on twin width is that if uh, you have an order witnessing that your adjacency um, matrix is uh, T mixed free, so we'll define this in a bit, then you can bound the twin weights. So somehow, uh, so yeah, I, I will define what T mixed free means. But uh, yeah, so a, a T mixed minor, no, yeah. so a, a T mixed minor is uh, somehow a division of your uh, like row sets and uh, column sets into cells such that each of the cells is uh, complicated. So we're not detailed, but essentially, each cell is not only a copy of the same row or a copy of the same line, uh, uh, column. So yeah, so if you can find, the, the important thing to note is that if you can find an order on, on, your, on your graphs of your class, such that uh, for any cut that you do on your matrix, you cannot get like, such uh, minors, uh, such grids uh, of arbitrary size, uh, then you bound it twin. So in particular, and in this talk, we'll, we'll only need this. If you find an order on um, matrices of, of on uh, graphs of your class, uh, such that the adjacency matrices forbids um, cuts into an arbitrary large uh, number of cells with a, a one in each cell, uh, then you also have a bounded twin it because you forbid the mixed uh, minors. So yeah. so yeah, this is a three mixed minor. It's a three by three division with each cell being complicated. And this is a four uh, grid minor, so it's weaker, um, in which, uh, so it's a division in four by four, so that each of the, the cells here has uh, at least one entry one. So yeah, basically the, the only thing to recall is that if you, in, in this talk, if you forbid, if you find your order such that you forbid such cuts uh, giving you arbitrary larger number of uh, cells with a one, then you bound the unit. So I will give uh, an example of this for, uh, for bounding the twin of trees. The <laughs> The twinit uh, of trees is actually two, but uh, it will serve as a as a justification, and you can show it uh, just by contraction sequences. But uh, this will serve yeah, as a justification for later on. So, uh, so let's say. Uh, so perhaps uh, the reason why you put the grid minor in the second last line is because I mean we could put mixed minor, but. Y yeah. This statement. Yeah, this is weaker, but still maybe yeah, yeah, it's yeah. good enough to prove what yeah. you want. Oh. The, that way, I don't have to because the mixed zones are somehow more complicated to deal with. But uh, for mm. for sparse classes, actually, you you only need to forbid a a, a good man. I mean, it's okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I will give an example to show that trees have bounded twin weights uh, using this method. So. Mostly be a drawing, but so um, so yeah, we want to find some order on any tree uh, such that the adjacency matrix of uh, witnessed by this order avoids some uh, grid minor. I if we manage to to do this, uh, then uh, we the, the the tree width of the twin width of the of trees uh, is bounded. So assuming it's not the case, uh, and let's take, uh, so you take G a tree. Mm. And you take, uh, you take sigma uh, any, any DFS uh, on the vertices of your tree. You start at any root, and you, you, you do your DFS. And uh, assume uh, for the sake of contradic contradiction 
So you can take any order, and you assume that uh, m of g um, can be cut like this into four by uh, four by four uh, grid minor. So I will take some color. So in particular, so okay. This is your ordering by sigma, and this is also sigma. Um, so in particular, you have a one in each cell here, right? This is your four by four grid minor, and you want to get some kind of absurdity, right? Um, so let's give a. This corresponds to vertices, right? On the on your. Um, on your uh, on your DFS order, so let, let's give a color to to each of these zones, and uh, let's see what this looks like on the on the graph, right? So uh, we have that uh, uh, green vertex here is uh, adjacent to a blue vertex, so. I will give them a number because it will be easier. <laughs> so this is, these are the zones uh, A, B, uh, C, and D. So you have a vertex of A here that is adjacent to a vertex of D. So a vertex at the beginning somehow of your DFS that is adjacent to a vertex at the end of it. So in particular, you have some, uh, take your root here, which is colored one. So you have a path to uh, another vertex colored A, uh, which is uh, adjacent to a vertex colored T. Right. So, and this is a path uh, just of, yeah, a, a path of A. Um, so now, uh, if I, I claim that all the all the b's here must also be in if <laughs> too bad. So I take this branch here. I know that I'm going through this branch before going back up on the on, on my DFS, and uh, so in particular, uh, like I have. I can't have any any twos here, any b's here. If I had a b here, like a, okay, I, I would have finished this branch before, so d would have been seen before being my DFS. So all my b's are here, and in particular, I have a, a path. Uh, well, I have some some b here that also sees uh, a vertex of d, right? So vertex that is seen afterwards. And, and and this B uh, has a has a path uh, of B and uh, of A uh, until uh, until A, right? And now uh, I do the same thing here, but for C, right? I say uh, okay, I am at B here in my order. Uh, I, s I, I enter z the zone D still while I'm in this branch. So my C, uh, my C's, so the vertices in my C, must also lie uh, in this branch. So in particular, I have my vertex of C that is adjacent to D, and I can find it here um, also. Um, actually, I don't even need this one. It's just all my vertices of uh, of uh, that are in the zone C are in this uh, one of the zones from uh, from one. Uh, I mean, twice or two. Yeah, two, you you get a contradiction. You cannot get uh, all zones uh, pairwise uh, adjacent. So uh, the conclusion <laughs> is that uh, so trees. So yeah, let, let's say the matrices of trees are uh, four, 
4 grid 3. Grid minor 3. I, I didn't quite understand. Why don't you have the edge we see back? Uh, because it's a tree. Uh, and yeah, you, you can't get C beforehand on the on the branch because you start this branch with a B and you reach your D here. And uh, if your C was adjacent to, to an A here, then you would have a cycle. I see. So, yeah. uh, so the matrices of trees are when ordered by a DFS, any DFS, are for a grid minor tree. So there are four mixed trees also. <coughs> uh, so they have a so the turn rate of trees is uh, at least uh, 2 to the 2 to the <laughs> well, bigger of 4, but it's something like 4. Uh, yeah, okay, no. Is the partition of the does the partition of the rows have to be the same <coughs> as the partition of the columns for the grid minor? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, but uh, hmm. well, if you forbid. Hmm. I think you can get around it by doing some merges. Mm. Yeah, uh, no, in general, it, it doesn't have to be like in, in the example here. Yeah, yeah. It, it isn't, right? But uh, yeah, uh, then you, <laughs> you, you can do some uh, painful merges uh, at, uh, at some point if you, <coughs> if you get some other cut. But uh, well, what if you know it does? Take a common refinement of two partitions. Maybe you can get some zones that the become uh, zero. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, so, yeah. assuming that you have T with minor, I see. So, uh -huh. <coughs> um, but I, I mean, okay, you might not be able to get the your contraction as easily as uh, <laughs> <laughs> as here. So I, I might be lying a bit, but the idea is is the same. It's a T one. Uh, but you will take some, you don't have to, I mean, it's also easy to exclude uh, minors in a zone that isn't uh, indexed by uh, like the same vertex uh, set. So like if you, if you look at thi this zone here and uh, you manage to, to forbid the uh, minors in between, so in between C and D and uh, A and B, uh, then this, of course, doesn't have to be cut in the same way, uh, but uh, like you can, you can exclude. Uh, I mean, you, you you can still get a like somehow some KTT between your CD and AB, and uh, still uh, get some contradiction, but uh, yeah, might not be as uh, straightforward. Is there a relationship between this DFS? Why are you looking only at DFS order? Is this Somehow related to the so, I, I'm saying if I find an order on my matrix class that uh, that uh, order. yeah that forbids uh, uh, grid uh, miners, then I bound it to it. So yeah, it, it, so in particular for for trees, uh, I was uh, lucky. I just took a a, a simple DFS sure. and it worked. Uh, but somehow, uh, yeah, you, you could have also taken a BFS. It also works for, for trees. And uh, yeah, so the, the roadmap uh, is the following. So when you want to bound the, the tunit of, um, of any class, if you, if you find a, an order that is grid free, uh, like, no, yeah, I, if you want to find an order that is grid free, you kind of have to follow some. Uh, Structural properties of, of your graph. Right. For trees, it was a DFS, which always already kind of follows uh, structural properties. But if you had taken any, uh, I don't know, random order on the vertices, then you could have zones that are spread out all across the, the tree and that are pairwise adjacent, right? So you could get your your grid minor. So you want to f to find some order that follows the structure. So you have to analyze, uh, yeah, the the structural properties of uh, 
of your class. And then, so yeah, as in the as is the case for trees, uh, you, f you find large green miners and you use them to get a contradiction. So you use them to violate your order, or in our case, to witness uh, induced thetas. So like here we use the the grid miner to get a cycle, um, but uh, we can get so somehow uh, the, the 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 whole goal here is to find an order that witnesses some uh, some theta instead of just a cycle, and then you you get a, a contradiction and you have found it. So the candidates, so you take your, your class so graphs of girth five at least, and uh, forbidding any induced subdivision of a theta and you want to find an order. So the first thing you can think of are again uh, BFS or DFS, but somehow, uh, so your BFS uh, skips at every, every layer of the, the BFS uh, kind of skips a, a vertex and like doesn't follow connected vertices. And in a DFS, you also skip at the end of branches and somehow, uh, yeah, th these these orders don't provide enough information on like connected paths to connected induced subgraphs, uh, which we need to somehow see that as. So the idea is to generalize generalize a BFS such that uh, instead of um, exploring just vertices, so instead of starting from one vertex and looking at its neighborhood exploring first its neighborhood and, and so on, uh, we s explore connected parts. So what do I mean I, by this? Um, so we say that a vertex at y is a minimal connected neighborhood of a vertex at x if it contains all the neighbors of x. Uh, so yeah, it contains the neighborhood of x. And if two uh, neighbors of x are in the same connected component when you remove x, they are still in the same connected component uh, in y. So yeah, the idea is that you add, you look at the neighbors of x, and you want to reconnect them as much as possible without using x. So I'll give a sketch. <coughs> so this is how the, um, the, so the first layer goes. So you start from any vertex V, and um, you look at uh, yeah, its neighbors. <coughs> In the rest of the graph, you know that there are there are these paths, right? Uh, but you know that so yeah, if you delete V, you cannot reach uh, from uh, from one pack to the other. Like you really have four uh, at least four uh, connected components, and so the idea is to pack them together and. Uh, in a minimal way, so you want uh, like a minimal subgraph that uh, connects uh, as much as possible each of those packs, right? So <coughs> then you define your uh, decomposition uh, as follows. Uh, so yeah, we have defined minimal connected neighborhood, and we use the minimal connected neighborhood successively to divide our BFS, which we call a connected BFS. Um, so you start from any vertex V, you get the minimal connected neighborhood. Uh, this becomes your layer one, so layer zero is vertex V. And then you do the same. You look at the neighbors here of, uh, of the whole vertex set uh, in, uh, in one of the components. And uh, you try to reconnect them uh, with, uh, as much as possible with, uh, in, in a minimal way. Uh, but, but you look at all the, the neighbors of here. You don't only look at the neighbors of, of, uh, of neighbors of V, right? You, you, all here you have two neighbors of V, and you needed a path to add a path to your minimal connected neighborhood so to reconnect it. Uh, so you look also at the neighbors of the path, right? So <coughs> the minimal connected neighborhood is not unique, right? You just take yeah, yeah. out of the No, it's not unique. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, yeah, it's enough. Uh, so yeah, you you do the same for other graphs, uh, for other like connected subgraphs of uh, of your first layer, and uh, yeah, basically you get a decomposition like this. 
and where at each step the layer i plus one is uh, the minimal connected neighborhood of the layer i uh, yi. <coughs> Uh, so what does this give us? So, okay, we will call the the, com the connected components of uh, each layer, like the graph in this page layer, we'll call them uh, by uh, y i j, uh, lexicographically according to their parents. So like if this is y one, then the, the children of y one are seen before the children of uh, y1, 2, right? And uh, we note the following. So of course, yi is only adjacent to the layer above and the layer beneath. And uh, a yi here can only have a, a single antecedent here. Like if your y24 here uh, was adjacent at vertices both in y1 and y3, y3, sorry. If this guy has vertices both in here and here, this would mean that you have a path. Um, so this is connected, right? Your y2, and this would mean that you have a path from uh, neighbors here to uh, y24 to neighbors here. So it means that you could have reconnected uh, these neighbors of v together earlier. So the structure you get between the, the components is really a tree. Um, so yeah, we, we have a, a first decomposition, which uh, is a layer-wise decomposition <coughs> into uh, partition, uh, into yeah, into classes, into components that <coughs> look like a tree overall. And somehow this is uh, yeah, this is a simple structure with respect to twin width. Uh, I mean, trees have bounded twin width, uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, somehow we don't we don't want to worry too much about the high twin widths coming from the, the global structure. So now you can ask, <coughs> so yeah, the, the goal is that, yeah, again, we assume that you, we can get arbitrary large minors, and we want to look at where we can find these minors, uh, if they were to appear. So it will become clearer <laughs> after the, the structural results, but I, I kind of need to dive into, like, like some structural analysis before I, I can exclude anything. So maybe you can ask, OK, if, if my structure here between the components is, is like a tree, uh, then maybe if I can find some grid minor, it's, so for some like natural order, uh, maybe it is inside one of the components, right? Um, and the answer is no, because uh, each of the components in your decomposition you can show that uh, it's a tree. So some you, we have hopes to order each of the components also in a way that bounds the twin. Right? Um, and uh, so yeah, each, uh, I will skip this part. So uh, the, the complexity um, between, uh, um, yeah, so, so somehow the, the complexity here isn't in the global structure, isn't inside one of those, so it must be in the in the, the edges between uh, in between uh, components of different layers, right? And so, so what do you mean by complexity? Do you mean yeah. something? Uh, or uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I, I, for now, I mean the complexity structurally, so just like intuitively, uh, but then it will turn out to like exclude grid minors, this kind of thing. Uh -huh. but somehow, like when you try to find uh, this, uh, your order, uh, you want to already kind of guess uh, which paths you can order in which way. And I it's not as straightforward as I just find the structural decomposition and then uh, uh, I'm lucky the structural decomposition gives me a good order. Uh, I look for the structural decomposition to get the good order, so it's a bit, um, Let's say the choices I make at any point here are natural, right? So, uh, if I, if at some point I, I find some structure that I can't order naturally, then I will get into some trouble. But as so, like here, the, the global structure is uh, a tree, so you can take a DFS or DFS order. You don't hope to. I mean, this seems natural, 
uh, the structure inside each of the components is a tree, so you can also take any DFS. Uh, and so, yeah, what I don't really know at this point is how I will find, how, how I will order these guys uh, together, right? Of, uh, who passes in front of who and how, what order I should choose on each of them. But yeah, uh, I, I just want to give, like in, in this section, I just want to give some structural properties and then we will see that uh, incidentally uh, they work well for designing a model, right? Um, so yeah, as I've said, you don't have too much complex structures inside one of the components. You don't have too much structure, uh, complex structures uh, overall in the, yeah, in, in, the C in the connected BFS tree. And uh, yeah, somehow the, if you want to find a complex structure, it seems that you have to look for, uh, for what happens in between a layer and the layer right next to it. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I will skip this. Uh, uh, so go can, can you go back a little bit? So, the reason why you each y i j is a tree is because the girls is big, or uh, or is it just so you take a subgraph? It's, it's, it's the only point uh, I think where we need girls at least five. Uh -huh. uh, well, yeah, so with GURF 4, so at, at first we wanted to prove uh, theta free, triangle free graphs have bounded to it, but somehow you don't get that this property that each uh, component is a tree, you only get with GURF 5. Or, I mean, mm -hmm. to the best of our knowledge. But we can hope to, to get it down to GURF 4. But it's not trivial, it's like playing with, uh, it's a technical lemma, uh, mm -hmm. playing within this subdivision. So, yeah, if you if you have some complexity in your graph, it must lie between one layer and this last layer, and so I I, I will s yeah I will go a bit fast on on, on this one, but basically uh, uh, like some structural I mean a first structural property of what happens between a layer and this next one is that if you look at vertices of the first layer and uh, their children on uh, the second layer, so but it is adjacent to it on the second layer, um, which they only they only have one parent. Um, but if you look at this, I irrespectively of uh, what happens between your vertices on the top layer, right? Just uh, look at the chi children, and you can see that you can find a, a path here that contains, uh, right? The so somehow uh, you, you color the children by the color of the pa their parents. And you can find uh, some principal path uh, such that uh, along this path, uh, I if you branch at any point, uh, so this yij is a tree, uh, so any of the branches that come out of a vertex here are have the same parent as, a, uh, as a, the point where they branch from. So this, okay, so this is already gives us some, some information. We want to kind of maybe follow, we want to use our order to follow this principal path because it seems like, yeah, it's one of the underlying structures of the, uh, of, a, of a layer with respect to its parents. Um, and now we look locally. Uh, so here we're, we're looking at, yeah, how do the children of different vertices relate independently of how the parents are connected, but you can also look uh, locally uh, at any, so looking at what happens with connected subgraphs, right? So you take any vertex in YI, and uh, which is, let's say, if it's the root of some, um, some, uh, oh yeah, if it's of degree at least, uh, at least three, uh, then it's, it becomes hard to order, right? Uh, so when you want to design an order like a DFS on your tree, uh, you don't have any choice to make if you if you are on a vertex of degree two. So like what you need to to order, so we want an order for y i, right? What you need to order are the branches, how you will explore the the branches around uh, any vertex, right? Um, so. Yi in itself is simple. It's a tree. 
you could take any DFS, as we have shown, and bound this to it, right? Um, but um, you, you can use y i plus 1 um, to uh, somehow break it being a tree, right? Uh, you can have some branches here, some different branches around your vertex, around your root, that uh, reconnect somehow using y i plus 1. And somehow, like the, the comp so this is like supports what I uh, was claiming earlier, that uh, yeah, if y i plus 1, if there is some complex structure in the graphs, it must lie because of edges between uh, y i and y i plus 1. Um, so somehow you, you can have some, uh, yeah, some we call them consecutivities, which are uh, shorted paths between uh, like reconnecting two different branches. I won't go into too much detail, but you can show that all but two branches at a given point have at most uh, two such consecutivities. So these are induced graphs, and somehow you can kind of start to see here that if you have too many uh, consecutivities, uh, you get theta, right? Um, so you kind of have some, yeah, each of the branches of YI connects only to two other branches at most. And um, yeah, so this gives you at worst a cycle, so except for two other branches, at worst a cycle. And then you can follow like some natural order on the cycle, or at least this synthetic. So uh, yeah, this is uh, how we, okay, no, now we are ready to construct the order, right? Uh, I have already hinted at it. Uh, until now, because like, somehow it's yeah, it's uh, I can't really split the structural analysis from the order we want to get, but uh, yeah, globally, recall that your components are related as a tree. So you follow them uh, lexicographically, as I already said, and so this means that just you design your order such that you see the vertices of y zero before those. So it, this is a partial order at this point. You see y0 before yi, before y1, 2, and so on. So this is, a, a globally, it's a, CB, uh, it's, a, it's a VFS between the components. And locally, um, so the, the branches at yi in any of the components intertwine little using the branches uh, using vertices in the bottom la layer, as we have seen uh, in, in the previous slide. So we order, we take a DFS on each of those that follows the, the cycles that, uh, that we have shown. Exist. So you, you take at any point during uh, on, on uh, YI here, uh, during your DFS, when you have a choice to make, uh, you, you follow the cycle. And uh, yeah, so this gives you an order of uh, mm. everything. And now we want to say that, uh, yeah, this uh, uh, like forbids grid miners. Uh, <laughs> so th this will become, I mean, it will reduce quite quickly to, to something uh, s simpler. So yeah, so for each graph in the class, we have found this order, right? Uh, th we have these graphs and sigma, so we can have a class of uh, all the matrices, and we say, uh, okay, if I have arbitrary large grid miners, I can find in the class, I can find a theta theory graph that uh, has this, uh, like this grid miner, and uh, yeah. So we assume that there exist arbitrary large grid miners. We use the global order we have, I mean, the global properties of our order to say that if there is a grid miner, there must also, a large grid miner, there must also be one in a local uh, zone, and then get the contradiction in a more local way. So globally, recall we have ordered our layers. So I'm, I'm not even talking about the components here. Uh, we have ordered our layers uh, from one to the other, and uh, layer yi is only adjacent to the layer before and the layer afterwards. So, oops. Uh, so the adjacency matrix looks like this. So you have y1, which is adjacent to at most y2 and r here. Um, and so yeah, it's a diagonal. And somehow, yeah, if you want to find large grid miners, they will, you also find the large grid miners 
in a zone uh, like this, indexed by two uh, by two um, consecutive uh, layers. So this means that if you want, if you can find large green minus in your class, you can find large green minus uh, also in in the like in the the subgraph induced by uh, two successive layers. Now uh, recall that each of the components, like adjacent to, to itself, it, it's only a forest, so or a tree. Um, I mean, each layer is a forest, each component is a tree, and so they have bounded to Inuit as long as we take a DFS, which we did. I, I recall it was the DFS that follows the consecutivity cycle. So uh, you can't find large green miners in this main diagonal, right? So if you have large green miners, they lie between so they lie in the adjacency between uh, some yi and some yi plus one. They, they lie in these red zones here. So it means that they lie in this edge here. Um, so now we assume, uh, so yeah, now in one zone, sorry, uh, again, we, we get a lexicographical order on the children components with respect to their parents. So in particular, like if you have layer Y here, uh, the components of layer Y and like the children components of each component of layer Y are ordered like following the same order. So this also gives you a, a diagonal again. Uh, and you know that, so yeah, uh, you, you order these guys in the same order as these guys. So you, in the adjacency matrix between these guys, you get a diagonal. So in particular, you get that if you have arbitrary large grid minus, you must also have uh, arbitrary large grid minus in some uh, cell indexed by uh, just one component and, and its children, right? Um, so yeah, to conclude then, you are in a very local setting. Uh, you have uh, one component, you have its children, and you have that you can get I mean, they can have arbitrary large green miners. So the idea is that yeah, you, you take one of these miners and you do somehow a slightly more complicated version of uh, what uh, we did for trees. Um, so somehow like the row sets of your green miner, um, as we have shown, th there will be sub forests of, uh, of your component ordered by a uh, DFS. So it, it's exactly as, uh, as it is here, uh, except like we only consider uh, one of, uh, I mean, one part. And so, yeah, we, we can say that the rows here corresponds to zones uh, uh, ordered by a DFS. But the columns here, uh, they are uh, sub, so like they, they will get you, they, they, are, they are only adjacencies, but they, they will get you um, adjacencies uh, between uh, like somehow you have this row which is adjacent to this column and this row is also adjacent to this column and you can use this to like try to reconnect the vertices of row 1 and row 2 and to, like you get you use these ones to get some non some consecutivity right and so you get Somehow, somehow you get too many. So let's say your rows correspond to this. Somehow, uh, like them being adjacent to so many columns um, with a one in it, will mean that. Uh, so this is uh, the tricky part. But whatever the rows correspond to in your layer Y i, uh, they will have to have a lot of consecutivities with the outside. So, but this is a bit absurd because we have ordered or y i's following this. And so somehow if you have vertices in, in this zone that have a lot of consecutivities with vertices in, uh, in the outside, then this kind of violates our order because it, it feels like the only consecutivities you can get from this zone to an outside zone are the ones are at, at the border, right? But these grid miners are uh, allowed to allow you to get any number of them. So. Uh, yeah, so this is how you get your contradiction. Uh, so you're somehow you get too much intertwining 
between the branches of R uh, to, to for this to correspond to your order, and so uh, you have uh, you have your contradiction, um, and uh, this gives you uh, the result that you forbid. Uh, so I don't have the exact constant, but it's a horrible constant, probably. <laughs> uh, but uh, if, if you forbid the uh, a set as in just circles and, and you have got at least five, um, then uh, you have bounded limit. So for the pass, uh, you can ask for are so is the same class of graph of bounded uh, QR stack number. Uh, so we believe it might be doable by somewhat m maybe the same order. Like it uh, somehow like the yeah it's it's very sparse and uh, even in this case uh, <coughs> yeah it, it didn't seem like uh, I mean it's easier to bound the the twin with. But uh, you could also bound the current stack number uh, if you get more precise in the analysis. And can you uh, extend the the same approach to bound a bit more than just a set? Like, can you bound any other subcubic graph of the of the world and also get bounded to it? So yeah, it's it's not obvious how it would generalize from this. But uh, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, I have some general questions. What's the intuition behind this the twin width? Yeah. I mean, the bounded twin width. I mean, the, the way you explain mm -hmm. kind of makes me feel like if whenever you take an exclusive OR, it kind of generates it. It's red that just get generated when you take an exclusive OR. So it feels a bit like when you merge multiple vertices, collapse multiple vertices into one. I mean, this red edges somehow count uh, how many different things got merged into the single node or something like this. So I just mm -hmm. want to get some intuitions about what does it really tell us and why it gives very nice algorithmic properties. Yeah. So, um, so the idea is that when you have, um, so, so to answer to one of the, I think maybe one, one of the comments, uh, is when you contract two vertices and you had a red edge between them, right? I if you get a like somehow, if you had a red edge between those and you contract them at some point, they end up in the same vertex. Uh, this doesn't count toward the red edge, a red degree, right? This only counts as a single vertex. But so, like, wh what you only count is at any point during the sequence, uh, the red degree between the contracted blobs. And so the intuition is the following, is that, uh, so yeah, when, when you have two vertices in your graph that have the same neighborhood, uh, you can kind of treat them the same in some algorithmical problems. Uh, like for example, in co-graphs, uh, like uh, you can split your vertex set into vertices that have the same neighborhood, and you, you have a lot of problems that are very easy to solve on co-graphs. And you also get uh, modular decompositions, which are, uh, yeah, which are like recursive uh, decomposition, which use this uh, structure, like try to group as much as possible vertices that have the same neighborhood. And for twin width, uh, the idea is to say, okay, maybe I don't have two vertices that have the the same neighborhood, but maybe they differ by one vertex, right? Maybe, uh, so uh, yeah, it's in the drawing. Maybe uh, they just have one private vertex each, and here they share uh, a lot of vertices. And I want to say, okay, this is still quite simple, right? Uh, modulo these edges, and I want to say, w somehow when I do my algorithmic, uh, but, so yeah, I, it's not exactly very simple, but yeah, w w when you do any kind of dynamic programming on your graph, uh, th this zone with respect to u and v would be easy to treat because uh, it would behave the same with respect to u, u and v. Right? Uh, there are also some non edges and some edges. Uh, but the only complex uh, somehow zones which you have to treat would be the zones that, uh, so yeah, this is when you contract u and v, would be the zones that um, that do not have uh, the, the same neighborhood. Um, and so, 
yeah, the, the, then it's like quite intricate uh, uh, model theory, but uh, so, so the, it's to get that uh, for any first order formula, you can check it uh, in FPT time on graphs of bounded tunit. But the idea, I think, uh, I mean, from my understanding of it, is the same: is that you uh, um, you get some kind of you, you use your contraction sequence as a um, backbone to a dynamic programming uh, algorithm, algorithm, and along the way, like you, you, like you record some information on 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 the. Um, on the on your logic formula, um, and along the way uh, you update this information, and you don't have so in a new contraction sequence you don't have to update too much information because the information that is hard to update is the information towards the red edges. So okay, thanks. <laughs> that was okay. uh, so the theorem proves that the this <coughs> class is have a bounded twin list, but for the application you need the contraction sequence, right? So yeah. uh, do you have an algorithm to mm. find the contraction sequence for set of three girls and list five girls? Um, yeah, well, my <coughs> I mean, it would be horrible again, because uh, the only constant that I get is through the, um, is through the mixed minor theorem. Um, but like, I can do my decomposition Algorithmically, yeah, yeah but that is for the ordering of the grid minor, right? Yeah, yeah, but then your grid minor theorem gives you an order, uh, a, a contraction sequence, right? It's a very bad contraction sequence, but if uh -huh. you have no uh, T grid minor, you have a two, t you, you build, uh, uh, y you can build it's the two to the T to the uh, quadratic. Oh, is, uh, so is that theorem is algorithmic? Yeah, I mean. Y yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say the theorem is algorithmic, but uh, it's basically you, yeah, you you cut your matrix into successive zones, and then you argue that uh, they have uh, th that you can part do the partition as you wish. So uh, you you can construct it from yeah. from what I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but can I ask another high level question? I mean, this grid minor theorem that you use, like a four, yeah. I mean, some, some grid minor doesn't exist imply bounded tree width. And then, now, given that you explain uh, some intuition behind that bounded tree width, can you somehow explain why this freeness of this uh, grid minor is somehow re kind of related to the, yeah. the intuition that you explain with the bounded tree width? Uh, so we found the uh, twin yeah. yeah, find the twin, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. So I just want to, based on the intuition, if I feel like, oh, that yeah, has yeah, to yeah. be true, then I'd be very happy. Mm. No. So it doesn't work with the, um, I mean, it, it isn't clear to me that you have a, so you want to show that no no large grid minor implies bounded twin. Yes, yeah, so is it like, just the, the things that you show is find the right ordering, right, of yeah. this is. So why does it matter so much about figuring out the bounded tributes? That's what I want to address. Uh, so like, w w how does this play into getting the bound on so, so, so I'm, oh, I'm asking only high level intuitions. Yeah. But then the, all the proof you, you showed was a bit like finding the right ordering of vertices. Mm. And then show that that doesn't have this property that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and then you, on the other hand, the, 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 the not your theorem, but the theorem that you use, say that if you find the right order that implies mm. bounded twin width, so why that theorem has to be true? Like why finding the right ordering of vertices imply you feel like you are saying there are if you do the dynamic programming there is only finitely many exceptions, yeah, yeah, yeah. very limited uh, amount of exceptions. I have to keep track of why there is a connection between the two. So yeah, it's not it's a bit obscure um, <laughs> because like, the the way the proof works for now uh, I mean and kind of the um, maybe you can show the converse the easier direction why bounded twin is implied there's an ordering uh, yeah. without having mixed yeah. minor so right. that direct if once you see that direction maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. then you can hope to have the converse <laughs> so. Um, yeah, somehow, when you have bounded twin weights, you <coughs> order 
um, your adjacency matrix by the order of contraction sequences. Um, well, like, you, you take any order such that uh, when you contract two vertices, uh, they are adjacent, like their rows and columns are adjacent. And uh, like a, a vertex, and so yeah, you, you start with uh, the finest, sorry, okay, I won't, I won't draw it, but you start with the finest partition of your vertex set. Uh, so you have one column for uh, each vertex, one, column, one row for each vertex. It's your regular, regular matrix. And then a contraction would be, I merge two rows and I merge the two corresponding columns and I record errors. And <coughs> in that case, uh, errors become, so let's say here is a, you had U and V. Uh, if you merge U and V and they didn't have the same neighborhood, um, then you get some, uh, <coughs> I mean, oh yeah. So, so like, let's say <coughs> here is some, some something in a new uh, NV. Um, so, so you must have some uh, one and some zero. So you must have a, a, a zone here that is non-constant. It is not all one or all zero. So if they were both adjacent to all the vertices here, um, then you would have all ones. And if they were both non-adjacent, you'd have all zeros. And so, <coughs> yeah, the, the idea, if you have your sequence of bounded twin it, is that you can, <coughs> like successively, you try to like merge uh, consecutive uh, um, uh, rows and, and the corresponding columns together. And if, if, if at some point you can't do it, it will mean that uh, somehow, so again, like uh, at any point, during, at a point during my, my contractual sequence, this is a, a set of rows, uh, a set of columns, and I have the same here. And so I have this division here at some point in the contraction sequence, which might contain a lot of vertices uh, in each of the in each of the like, divisions. Uh, and I have that I can't contract like any uh, consecutive, so then I, I contract zones together, right? Like this is, uh, at one point this is one zone, and this is the other. And I get that any consecutive zones, if I contract them, I create non-constant zones. I, I create, um, okay, sorry. So, so yeah, th this is like a red edge, okay? So this non-constant uh, thing. Um, and uh, the goal is to find a sequence that bounds a number of, of times uh, a zone like this appears, like uh, among uh, all of them. So if at some point during the contraction sequence, every like consecutive, like pairwise consecutive fusion creates too many of these things, um, then uh, um, then I mean I, I get too many mixed zones here, and uh, so for, for for each of them, and you can find wait uh, no okay I'm proving the converse actually yeah uh, no no right. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah okay no I, I actually okay this is even yeah, okay, this is. Uh, gladly simpler. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you just basically you, you perform your contractions, you have that the red degree is bounded, so also the number of zones here is bounded. And uh, if you had a large grid minor, uh, at some point you would have like one of the, let's say, rows of your grid minor wholly contained in one of those zones, and it would give you like too many, um, sorry, mixed minors. It will give you too many red edges uh, at some point during the sequence. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Other quick questions, maybe? Tell me. Yeah. Can you do such a thing with other sparse definition instead of first? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so like we kind of started with triangle three because uh, that was like the path that. Um, <coughs> Three people uh, were doing. Uh, I mean, you, you 
probably I'm not sure. You probably can get a counter example uh, if you if you allow triangles, but you only say like KT KTT three. <coughs> Uh, because uh, yeah, I'm I'm not sure exactly, but but basically we we first took the counter example to uh, like bounded through it to this graph something bounded through it, and we looked at how does it bound it through it, and then we tried to generalize that class. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.